to start with, I just wondered, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about how you chose that title and what it is intended to stand for. Um, also, I called it Dirty Wars because uh, I think that there is a sense among a lot, particularly a lot of liberals right now who are passionately supporting the president as waging a smarter form of war, is that the drone wars are clean. And so it's sort of pushback on that. Um, the subtitle of it, The World is a Battlefield, is actually a quote from a, um, a, a guy who works in the JSOC community who told me that the world is, is a battlefield now, meaning that the U.S. can strike wherever it wants, whenever it wants. But it actually is, what he's referring to, is military doctrine um, that I'm sure you're familiar with called operational preparation of the battle space. And basically, uh, preparation of the battle space provides that if the U.S. military believes that there will be hostilities, future hostilities in a country or a war, that special operations forces can forward deploy to those countries in the absence of a declaration of war and operate in a covert nature to prepare the battle space. And, and Bush and, and Cheney and Rumsfeld really did start to perceive the entire world as the battle space, and so they started to expand the operations of JSOC, and that's something that continues under President Obama. Yeah. And recently we had uh, Senator Lindsey Graham <clears throat> making sure, just in, in case anyone missed the point, it's not just, when we say that the world is a battlefield, it means including the homeland as a battlefield in his, what I find, a, a memorably creepy phrase. But um, does he not have a point? I mean, a lot of people will say, in fact, Lindsey Graham himself said that the reason the homeland is uh, the battlefield is because the terrorists think it's the battlefield, and therefore it is. Right. I mean, I, I, I think that we, we've sort of, uh, you know, made into this giant boogeyman um, terrorism as this existential threat to our society. It's not that there aren't real plots. There are very real plots. There are people that want to blow up U.S. airplanes. Uh, there's a guy who tried to set off a bomb in Times Square. There was a plot to bomb the subways. I mean, these things are happening. Right. But I, I, I think that what we, we as a society are, are so quick to militarize our approach to combating drugs, to combating terrorism is a form of crime. When you're plotting to blow something up, it's the same, as, it, it's, it's the same effect as someone going into one of our schools and shooting it. So in, in, in sort of reacting to you know, a very real problem, albeit one that I think is exaggerated in terms of its level of importance or the level of threat. Right. Um, I think we're losing part of our own values. Um, and, you know, the, the, the idea that, that international terrorists could threaten the existence of the democratic system in the United States is, is just, you know, totally false. Yeah. Um, these, these people do need to be confronted who are, who are plotting, but I think we have a robust legal system in this country. The only successful prosecutions since 9-11 have been through the civilian justice system. We've got people languishing in Guantanamo who've been cleared for release and they're still sitting there. So I, I, you know, when they called for this um, Tsarnaev kid, Jahar Tsarnaev, who you know, is, is suspected of being one of the, the, right. the bombers in Boston, those guys, the Republicans were calling for him to be treated as an enemy combatant and some were saying he should be you know, sent to, to Guantanamo. If, if that's gonna be our response as a society to certain kinds of crimes, uh, where it's like the, the mob can come with the pitchforks and you know, torches to deliver citizens justice, then, then we're actually a different country and we should stop portraying ourselves as sort of different than the rest of the world. So this is one of the things that um, I, I think you can almost call a theme in the book and that really interested me because it kept coming up again and again. You don't depict lawmakers um, overtly saying the law doesn't matter or um, um, America is no longer a nation under the rule of law. Nobody says that. But what they do is they, they look at the law and they find ways, often through twist, twisting the language, to render the law, um, to neuter it. So for example, um, assassinations are illegal. We have a presidential uh, an executive order prohibiting assassinations. How do you get around that? They call them targeted killings of enemy combatants. That's not an assassination. Right. You're not allowed to torture. So well, then it's not, it's not torture. Um, it's enhanced it's, interrogation techniques. Or, you know, exactly. So that was, that was, how much of that do you see as, as a problem um, in America cashing in its values, maybe without even being aware of it. Right, you know, you know what's interesting about the, uh, the um, executive order uh, prohibiting assassination? There's an interesting history to how that happened. You know, re remember that the first president to sign that executive order was, was Gerald Ford. And it was, it was coming out of this era, the Nixon era, where you had the, the church committee that was investigating assassinations, you had the House committee on, committee, on, yeah. On, yeah, on, on political assassinations, and Ford issued that executive order, but Congress has never passed it as a law. Mm. There have been, there have been, there's been discussion of it, but Congress hasn't passed it as a law, and, and the reason is because Congress doesn't want to uh, be on record saying that the, that the commander-in-chief can't do these kinds of killing operations, right. so it's something where assassination is very narrowly defined. When, when it was originally uh, uh, signed by Gerald Ford, it was just political assassinations. And Jimmy Carter, uh, when he was president, removed the word political. 
And then he added uh, any agents of the U.S. government, meaning contractors or people that are working as assets right. for the U.S., potentially in intelligence services. And every president, all the way through President Obama, has kept some form of that executive order on paper. And each one of those presidents have found a way to systematically violate their own order yeah. uh, by, by saying, well, it's not a, an assassination. This is, uh, this is a, a strike aimed at military facilities in Baghdad, for instance, when Clinton bombed Baghdad in, uh, in December of uh, 1998. Yes. That's a, it's, I find that uh, a fascinating way to, to end run any law you want. Um, declaring, for example, the Fifth Amendment and Sixth Amendment are pretty clear on, uh, for example, the government not being able to deprive anyone of life, liberty, or, or property without due process of law, and the Sixth Amendment is clear on, on right to counsel. So how do you get around that? Well, you just declare someone an enemy combatant. And in fact, this is something you talk about in the epilogue of the book, and I just would love to hear more about it. Uh, the Pentagon General Counsel, Jay Johnson, yeah essentially saying like, look, you know, these things, these laws make sense in a civilian context, but we're not really in a civilian context anymore. And what he does is he takes the war, which should be the exception, and uses it to just smother the rule. So if the world, if the world is a battlefield, then... Right, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting too, because when, when, when confronted with what legal authorities the, the U.S. Is, is using to justify the bombing of Yemen, uh, the Obama administration will point to the original authorization for the use of military force, the AUMF, which was passed a few days after 9-11. Uh, and the, o the, only me the only member of Congress that voted against that was Barbara Lee. Yeah. And I, I describe her speech in the, um, uh, in the book because it was so unusual. If you remember the, the climate in the country at that time, she was trembling when she gave her speech. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because, it, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, I haven't asked her about it, but I would imagine that she... She knew that she was doing something that was potentially career-ending. Oh yeah, but and 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 That's actually life-ending. If you death well, she received yeah, death threats yeah. after that. Speech. But if you if you go back, I th I think it would, be, it would be a really instructive, especially for young people, to go back and read Barbara Lee's speech because she was a hundred percent right yeah. about what what was going to happen. She saw it coming, and it's it was quite prophetic. But the 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 idea that that now twelve years after that was passed, and it was to, it was passed to go after the people responsible right. for the nine eleven attacks, and and the overwhelming majority of Americans supported that, and and the overwhelming majority of Americans supported a campaign to go after Osama bin Laden and break the the back of the Al Qaeda network. It, it was it was within a year that the mission turned into something different in Afghanistan, and then they start plotting for Iraq, and now here we are twelve years later, and President Obama is using this AUMF to go after people, some of whom were toddlers on 9-11, which was passed to go after the people responsible for the 9-11 attacks. So I think you're going to see liberals, um, and this has already started on MSNBC, calling for a repeal of the AUMF. Yeah. But there's something no one ever talks about. Article 2 of the Constitution, the, the, the Commander-in-Chief clauses, uh, Cheney and Rumsfeld believed that that made the president a dictator when it came to national security policy. And the Obama administration has continued to interpret it that way. So, I mean, what we've really seen is a bipartisan power grab uh, by the executive branch that was legitimized by a constitutional law professor, Nobel Peace Prize winning president. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite amazing. We live in strange times. There was a two-week period in late 2011, September, October, where President Obama authorized a series of drone strikes that resulted in killing three American citizens, none of whom had been charged with any crime or had evidence presented against them. And, and when, when that happened, and we can talk about the circumstances and who the people were, but, but when that happened, which was quite an extraordinary line to cross, um, there were only two basic reactions in Washington, silence or enthusiastic support. Hil you know, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton sounded almost uh, identical to John McCain and Lindsey Graham in praising that operation. Yeah. And, uh, and the only people that raised a voice uh, against it or, or questioned it were, were Ron Paul, who at the time was waging an insurgent right. campaign for the Republican nomination for president, and, and Dennis Kucinich. And outside of that, I mean, the, the Democratic establishment has made possible the expansion um, of these strikes because there has been no serious questioning of the policy, no serious analysis for you know, the entire duration of the Obama presidency. What, what has been the effect, would you say, on the, of the Obama presidency on this kind of um, uh, creep in presidential unconstitutional exercise or exercise of unconstitutional powers. I mean, for, first of all, I think there's the, the, that there's a there's a big difference between between Obama and someone like Dick Cheney. Like I, I you know, I, I, I see though Dick Cheney sort of in his lair plotting the destruction of the world. So Halliburton <laughs> stocks go. I mean, I actually think that that the cartoonish the Darth Vaderization of Dick Cheney is probably pretty accurate. I think he's a really <laughs> rotten human being. Um, but I, I think that I think that Obama has President Obama has bought into this notion 
that he is waging a smarter war and that this is the best way to keep America safe. And I think that, uh, that, that they're starting to believe their own rhetoric about the effectiveness of the campaign. And so you, you asked me what sort of the, the impact has been. I, I, I believe that particularly in, Somal in uh, Yemen and Pakistan, that we're actually creating more enemies than we are killing terrorists. And, and, and I'm, it's complicated. I don't necessarily think that we are aiding Al-Qaeda. That, that's the number one impact that's happening. I think what we're going to see is disparate groups pop up that are not Al-Qaeda, that are resistance movements in, that, that are motivated by legitimate grievances against the United States for killing their loved ones or wiping out a village. I had a very telling interaction. I don't normally interact with powerful officials. I don't go to the White House Correspondents' Dinner and laugh at the president making jokes about drone strikes, and I don't go to uh, the super soaker parties at you know, Joe Biden's. You haven't uh, swung on uh, any tire Chuck swings. Chuck Todd and I are not <laughs> playing you know, water balloon toss together. No tire um, swings. No, no tire swings, swings right. Yeah. Um, uh, no, no shooting hoops. <laughs> but, um, uh, but I recently met a former senior official from the Obama administration who worked directly on the targeted killing program and was one of the people who would sign off on the strikes. And I asked him about a, um, a, a bombing that took place in Yemen. The first time that President Obama authorized a, a, an airstrike against Yemen was in December of 2009 and, in this village called Al Majla. And the US intelligence indicated that it was a, uh, an Al Qaeda training facility. And I think that the Yemeni government and the Saudis had provided this intelligence to the US. And that's a whole other story. They feed bad intel all the time. So they do this strike. And, um, and it, it ends up killing uh, 46 people. Yeah. You know, 14 of them are women, 21 are children. And you know, we, we, when we went to Yemen, we went down to Abiyan province where this was, and we, we, we videotaped the missile parts that are still there, these cruise missiles and the cluster bombs. And we gathered evidence from the survivors, video, horrifying video of the aftermath of this attack where just human beings were shredded into, into meat, basically. And it was... I mean, cluster bombs are a horrid weapon. They're like flying landmines. And, uh, you know, the, 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 an, the meat of animals with human flesh sort of all mixed together and babies being pulled out of rubble and, you know, so clear that this was a, a village of civilians. And I asked this, this former official who was in the White House at the time, you know, why did you sign off on, on, on a bombing that killed 46 people, three dozen of whom were women and children? And he said, I never signed off on something that killed three dozen women and children. And I said, but you signed off on the modular strike. And he said, I'm saying to you, and he was talking to me like this, I never signed off on anything that killed three dozen women and children. Mm. The, the sense I got was that they, don't, they, they cannot face the idea that that's what happened there. And they need to believe that what they did was destroyed an Al-Qaeda camp because otherwise yeah. you're, you're, you're facing a moral crisis that yeah. you, you can't walk away from that. Jay Johnson said when he watched the, the, uh, the, the, the satellite imagery of that attack, that if he were Catholic, he'd have to go to confession. Yeah. Um, you know, but then this other guy is saying, I, never, I didn't do that. You know, they know exactly. You know, they, in Yemen, in particular, there's an interesting spy game going on. I think the US is getting played like a piano by the Saudis and, at, at, at times, by the Yemeni regime. Uh, the, the, the longtime dictator of Yemen, Ali Abdullah Saleh, was a very crafty guy and, and knew how to play various forces off of each other. And I think when, when Obama came into office, uh, they wanted to make their mark early and start striking because they had pledged to wage a smarter war, taking the fight to the terrorists. And so they're putting all this pressure on the Yemeni government, on the Pakistani government, um, to, to start working in, in more concert with the U.S. in these campaigns. And I think that Yemen realized that it needed to give results to the U.S. So they start saying, well, here in this village, there's a terrorist training camp, and there's this dangerous man named Mohammed al-Khazmi, and we need to take him out. Mohammed al-Khazmi was an old mujahideen who fought on the U.S. side in the Afghan war. That was the original target of that strike. I mean, it's ridiculous. When you go there and you actually look at who was killed, I think the Yemeni government basically sold them this idea and told, told the Obama administration, here's this intel, and we're going to let you take out a dangerous terror network in our country. And I think that they thought, the Yemeni regime thought, it's a Bedouin village of poor people in the middle of nowhere. No one will ever go to to follow up on it. Um, there also was a case where uh, US forces killed a deputy governor in, of, of a province in Yemen who was a political opponent of the dictator, the US-backed dictator, uh, because the, the, the US was fed bad intelligence. They were taking out political opponents for dictators now. Then in Afghanistan, we tell these stories where it's like someone is, 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 is upset, has a grudge against another family, and they know how the American system works. Three human reports, three human intelligence reports of people going to an American base and saying, these guys are Taliban, you know, suicide bomber factory people. And then, you know, they go, one goes on a Tuesday, the other goes on a Thursday, the other goes on Sunday, and next thing you know, there's a night raid authorized. 
And so Navy SEALs go in, they think they're raiding a, a Taliban stronghold. Oops, we just killed a family. And I mean, this happens over and over and over. It's and not it's, new either. I mean, if you read about the Phoenix program in Vietnam and you see that all these programs get corrupted the same way, they're just because of the, uh, the universal system of human incentives and disincentives. If you find some people who are, who are saying, look, if they're communists or if they're terrorists, we've got some people who are kill we'll, we'll kill them, you'll find some people saying, yeah, those guys are terrorists, those guys are communists, when in fact they're just people they don't like, or maybe they owe those people money and it would be convenient for them if they were to be taken out, and <clears throat> that's what happens to programs you know, like this. I mean, I, I, I compare sort of what JSOC was doing in Iraq. You know, there's this myth that David Petraeus won the Iraq war with his yeah. surge. I mean, it's just a crock. I mean, like, everyone in the military knows that's just, you know, bogus. I mean, David Petraeus has, if he had not gone down from the only thing that ever seems to bring political figures down in the U.S., you know, it's like, you know, it's, it's, what, it's, it's, it's what they're doing to people in private that gets them taken out. But what they do in public, even if it's criminal, it's like, you know, you fail upwards. Um, but, but, uh, but, so, so, but what really happened in Iraq, and, and I get into great detail about this in the book, is that JSOC just, just turned into Murder, Inc., and they just started bumping people off. And, and that, in combination with the U.S., paying the Sunni tribes in Anbar province and elsewhere, the awakening councils, not to kill American soldiers or not to attack them. Those two things were what caused this reduction in violence that allowed Petraeus to, to uh, say that he had won the war. In reality, they had just killed a tremendous number of people. And then, then this massive civil war breaks out in Iraq, and it, and it continues to this day. Yeah. But, but JSOC developed this systematic way of hunting down and killing anyone that would pop up. And it wasn't even Al-Qaeda anymore. It would be, this neighborhood has organized a resistance attack against it. Let's figure out who the three guys are, snatch one of them so we can kill the other two. And it goes on and on and on. And it's very similar to the Phoenix program. And there's a lot of mercenaries and uh, forces from other countries that we're working with. Some very unsavory characters are, are back on the US payroll right now. And it's, you know, I think somewhere Cheney is like sitting fly fishing, thinking, it's kind of great that Obama did this. You know, this is going to be real helpful for Marco Rubio's administration or whatever, you know, Jeb Bush. We actually got a rare uh, opportunity to see the sausage made with the whole Judith Miller, Dick Cheney yes. relationship where, you know, Dick Cheney tells Judith Miller there's this mushroom cloud. Then Judith Miller yes. prints this, that there's this mushroom cloud threat in Iraq. And then Cheney goes on Meet the, the Press and says, shows, yeah. well, do you see what Judith Miller's reporting in, in the, the New, New York, York Times, Times about the mushroom it's amazing. cloud? It's, it's like, absolutely amazing. It's a self-licking ice cream cone, you know, like as, 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 as uh, someone in the book tells me, this former Special Forces Colonel. The first thing that I do when I get up in the morning is look at Twitter. I don't look, I don't go to any news site anymore. It used to be that I would read international papers. I would, you know, I would read The Guardian and I would read The Times of London, The Financial Times, and I would go to, and I would read all of these papers um, from around the world uh, or, or certain blogs. Now I go to Twitter because you can curate your own list of individual yes. reporters without having the middleman of their employer getting that. in the way. Totally and, and, and there are some great reporters who are breaking news on Twitter all the time. Yeah. I, I think we're at an interesting moment in the history of journalism right now where the, the monopoly of the corporations, even though they still control the airwaves and yeah. everything, their monopoly on the dissemination of, of information in any kind of a digestible way right. is broken. It's shattered Agreed. because of citizen journalists. Yeah. What I think, I, I ultimately think, you know, we all are discussing how do you fund journalism, how do you keep it afloat. It's very hard. I spend several months a year fundraising yeah. to try to do this journalism. It's expensive to go on these trips, and yeah. have to, I often end up begging people for money to go and do them. Uh, but I think that that's somewhere down the line, we're good. we have to, to, to figure out a way to combine what is so important about old school muckraking yeah. uh, and, and have fact checkers and researchers and in some cases legal review of articles if you're reporting something sensitive with this great new open energy that is reflected by so many, particularly young journalists on Twitter. And, um, and I, don't, I don't have the answer to it, but I'm excited about to see what the next generation of uh, of young journalists or, or aspiring journalists are going to bring, because I, I, I think we're going to see some really creative new approaches to disseminating information and analysis. <laughs> well, one, one, one thing, and I, I write about this in the book, when this incredible story played out in Lahore, Pakistan, uh, in, uh, in January of 2011, um, do people, people I'm sure remember the, uh, the story of Raymond Davis, sure. the CIA contractor. Again, great two chapters, I think, in the book on that. Yeah, yeah. the curious case of, uh, of Raymond Davis, Act 1 and Act 2 is the title of it. But so Davis was this guy who, was, uh, who sort of uh, crossed into a number of different uh, parts of the, the global covert wars. Uh, he was a, a Blackwater contractor who also was a special forces guy who was on contract for the CIA in Pakistan. And what exactly he was doing is the source of a great deal of mystery, but he um, ends up in the streets of Lahore and shoots two uh, Pakistani guys on a motorcycle. 
and, uh, and shoots them from the car, and you know, dead, dead shots, and then goes up and pumps rounds into them, and, and then calmly walks back and gets in his car and, and, and tries to drive away. And he calls for backup, and a van comes and runs over another Pakistani, and it's, uncle uh, Pakistani, and it's unclear uh, you know, what exactly those guys were doing, but it seems that they were, they were up to something, probably for JSOC on the side, also working with the CIA. But remember what was going on at that time. Raymond Davis gets put into this prison in Pakistan, and there's calls for his death, you know, from all throughout the country. And, uh, and meanwhile, in Washington, Obama is being briefed on a house in Abbottabad, Pakistan, where they believe they found Osama bin Laden. And they, they, wanted to, they wanted to hit Osama bin Laden much earlier in 2011, but they have a CIA Blackwater JSOC guy stuck in a Pakistani prison who just killed two guys that may have been ISI agents, Pakistani spies themselves. So they had to get Raymond Davis out of Pakistan because they, the assessment of the CIA was that if they did the bin Laden raid, that Raymond Davis would almost certainly be uh, executed in that prison if not killed by other prisoners, killed officially by the Pakistani government. So John Kerry, who of course now is the Secretary of State, uh, went over there and, and, and negotiated with the Pakistanis. They basically, uh, he and Hillary Clinton, said they settled on a number to, play, to pay blood money mm -hmm. to the families of those Pakistanis, and then they had to get Raymond Davis out. And he had sort of an, uh, mm -hmm. of an, an unceremonious uh, uh, end to his career recently uh, when he got into an altercation outside of an Einstein's bagels. Uh, and, and, and beat someone up over a parking spot. So Raymond Davis never faced any criminal charges for killing these people in the streets of Pakistan, but he, uh, he did uh, face charge, criminal charges for battery, uh, outside, for beating someone up outside of an Einstein's bagel. It's, it's, I don't know why it makes, it reminds me of the fact that we would, um, the government would need some sort of um, warrant to wiretap Anwar Awlaki, but needed no judicial or other due process really whatsoever to have him killed. But that, that you're almost verbatim quoting Michael Hayden, the former CIA director, who said, you know, the liberals hit us so hard for the warrantless wiretapping stuff, but, you, but you're not demanding that there be a criminal charge against al before we kill him. I mean, and just so people remember that, you know, Anwar al uh, and, and you know, we can, if people wanna talk more about this later, we can, but Anwar al was a guy who many Americans, I think, just remember from one moment in his life, which is that he had this camouflage jacket on in front of a black flag calling for armed jihad against the United States. He really was a product of American foreign policy. He was radicalized as a result of watching the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, Abu Ghraib, all of this stuff. And, um, and eventually then he, you know, he's killed in, uh, in Yemen. He was born in New Mexico and had been an imam at a mosque in Virginia. Um, and you know, what I, what I, I've sort of been trying to figure out how to explain to people why I think that is such an important story. And I've, I've really come to the, the conclusion, both morally and strategically, that it's not about who al Laki was at all. It's about, it's about who we are as a society. You know, what, what, how do we handle the most reprehensible people in our society? Like, what should the standard be? Because that, that really is how we're, we're, we're judged as a society. So if there are certain people that aren't on declared battlefields that we've decided should be assassinated, then we should probably change the, the Constitution and say, well, these people actually don't have access to due process or the judicial process. The story of Anwar Alaki occupies a, a significant portion of the book. And in fact, I mean, it's I the spine it's, it's of the book. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. For two reasons. One is, he, Alaki is emblematic of, of what uh, our policies can do, how they can be counterproductive. You can take someone who originally was essentially sympathetic to the United States. This guy was, in fact, a United States citizen. After 9-11, he was on various news shows. Um, he was considered a kind of textbook um, moderate Muslim who could explain that this is a perversion of Islam and, uh, and this, this kind of thing is terrible and reprehensible. And then over the course of the intervening years became uh, more and more radicalized um, by US policies to the point where the United States then had to kill him, which is the second thing that's emblematic of how far can these extra, these unconstitutional and extra ju judicial policies go. Right. I think. I think as far as they can go is where the president can start authorizing the execution of American citizens without due process. And so Alaki is also the, the textbook example of that. Yeah, and I mean, there's also, there's not many funny moments in the book, but uh, at all, as you would imagine. Um, but, uh, I don't know, it's but, called but Dirty but one, Wars, I don't yeah, know why. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a romantic comedy. When I, you know, this is, this, 
this sort of, you know, we have a, we have a film that's Don't coming out. Don't show it to Hollywood, that will happen. We have a film that's coming out by the same name, Dirty Wars, and it premiered at Sundance, and I was in like these, these lines with, uh, you know, actual like movie stars who are being interviewed about their film by, you know, these women wearing these big furs and their hair is all done up, and, you know, Demi Moore is doing whippets in some hot tub somewhere, and, <laughs> and, and so here we are, and, and, and you're being interviewed, and, and um, they don't know like what our film is at all. They're just handed a card, <laughs> Dirty Wars, you're speaking to the writer of it. And at one point, I, I, uh, I was being interviewed by a very large fur with a woman's face uh, coming out of it um, <laughs> on a red carpet. And she's like, so, Dirty Horse. And, uh, and I, <laughs> I said, excuse me, she goes, tell us about Dirty Horse. <laughs> and I actually thought, I didn't think she said horse, I thought she said something else. I'm like, my God, how did I end up here? Um, but that's not the funny story in the book. The funny story in the book. <laughs> And the book is that the CIA actually facilitated Anwar Awlaki marrying another wife while underground. They found him. And it's amazing, amazing it's, chapter in the book. It's, a, it's, it's so surreal to me, and it's, it's, it's so awesome that you, could, you would not be able to make that story up to put into your novel. Even but, if I thought of it, I wouldn't right. do it because I'd say nobody's going to believe right. it. Right. So, the, so this guy, I mean, this is such an epic story. There's this, this, uh, this guy named Murad Storm, Mor or Morton Storm, which is an awesome name, uh, was a friend of Anwar al Awlaki's in Yemen in the, in the sort of mid-2000s, like 2004, 2005. They had studied at a, at a university there together. And, and he was a, a former biker gang guy with a long criminal record. And he had a converted to Islam and wanted to, you know, aspire to sort of be an, a jihadist. And he had met al Awlaki, you know, early on when, before al Awlaki went underground. And when, he, when, when, this, when it became clear that the U.S. was hunting al Awlaki, Morton Storm thinks he can cash in on this. And, and he, 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 so he goes to, he, he was a Danish guy, he goes to the Danish intelligence service, the PET, and, uh, and he says to them, you know, I, I'm in touch with Al-Laki, and I, I, can, you know, I can help you track him. And so he starts reaching out to Al-Laki, and then the PET, the Danish intelligence people, get in touch with the CIA, and the CIA send operatives over to go and meet with uh, Morton Storm, and they start working together with Morton Storm, and I think the CIA paid him uh, $250,000 at one point, and they, they gave him a briefcase with a, with a code lock on it, and Storm asked them what the code is, and they said, try 007, which is like so cheesy, but it's awesomely true. Um, so, so Morton Storm, they, they, he starts uh, communicating with Alaki, and they come up with this idea, and it's unclear whose idea it was, the CIA's, Morton Storm's, or Alaki's, that um, Alaki needs a, a, a new wife to join him underground. Because his, his first wife and his children were living with his family in Sana'a. He had nothing to do with them and is, is being chased by the U.S. So they, they hatched this plot. And, um, and, and Morton Storm literally places an ad on Facebook um, for, for a, a bride for, for Anwar al And they get all of these responses from women around the world wanting to marry Anwar al -Laki. It's like jihadi OK Cupid or something. And, uh, <laughs> and, um, and, and so, <laughs> so they, they, they decide on this young woman who's a Croatian named Amina who was a, a convert from Catholicism to Islam, and she and Al-Laki exchange a series of video messages to each other. And, and we, I have the video messages. So it's like, you know, she's describing why she wants to marry Anwar Al-Laki, and then Al-Laki is going back and explaining what life would be like for her, that she's, you know, you have to be, be willing to live in a tent and with a minimum number of toiletries available to you and all this <laughs> stuff. And, um, and so, so Amina and Al-Laki agree that they are going to marry. So the CIA pays for Amina to fly to Yemen, and they, uh, but she doesn't know this at all. She just thinks that she's marrying Anwar al and that's what she wants to do in her videos, say that she's ready to face death if necessary for her faith in Islam. And, uh, and, and they give her luggage, like I, I imagine like these Louis Vuitton bags that they've given her, that have tracking devices in them. And the plan was for her to go w and meet up with al and for the CIA to kill both of them in a drone strike. Which, I mean, on a moral level, it's just utterly reprehensible that you would use this, I mean, woman who has no idea that that's how she's being used to try to find him and then blow, blow both of them up. So she, she lands in Sana, and al guys come to pick her up, and they ditch the luggage and tell her to change her clothes, and they give her new clothes, and so the luggage remains in Sana, and she goes and actually marries Anwar al and has a <laughs> child with him, and then lives life underground with Anwar al And Storm so kept the money. So it's, and, and Morton Storm kept the money, and he's got a huge, I think, book contract right now, but it's... Um, uh, it's, it's, that's why I call it the CIA's dating service. Yeah. <laughs> and there you have the only funny thing in my book. <laughs> you know, if you, yeah, that, that chapter was, um, was hard to believe. I think that there's, there, there's only the very beginning of a, of, the dis of a discussion we should have had 12 years ago in this country and in a very serious way, which is how far are we, we willing to go in, uh, in policies that are ultimately are, are inspired by, uh, by fear? Yeah. 
you know, we're operating out of fear as a society. When, when the Boston Marathon bombing happened, then they declared martial law in Boston, and they, you know, we shut it down, and you have calls for people to be treated as enemy combatants. And, you know, we, we're motivated, I think, by the power of nightmares. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and how, but, but how do you dismantle that? I think it's so deeply ingrained now in the conscience of our uh, society that it's a real uphill battle. Um, I thought it was a positive thing when Rand Paul, the Tea Party senator, who I think is, is utterly reprehensible in so many ways with the policies that he takes about on racial issues, on women's uh, rights issues, on women's health care yeah. issues. I mean, you could go down the line. But, but Rand that doesn't Paul, mean he's wrong on everything. Right. So, and I didn't do I stand with <clears throat> Rand because I don't stand with Rand. Right. But I, I, I did think that he, uh, he did something that was epic. He shut down the nomination process of John Brennan as CIA director demanding that the White House provide information on how Americans get on and off of kill lists. And he read into the record great reporting of people like Glenn Greenwald or Spencer Ackerman and you know, people that have been covering this, the drone strike issue. And he put on record for the first time the fact that the United States killed these three U.S. citizens in a two-week period. And, and so about 33% of that day was some of the most sane talk that we've had on the floor of the Senate about these issues. And then the rest of the two, thir two thirds was just the dingbat factory from the Tea Party coming in and talking about Jane Fonda being blown up in a cafe in Berkeley. Yeah. You know, um, and, and you know, the idea, was the president gonna kill Jane Fonda for hanging out with the Viet Cong? Um, but but the, the, the point being, if, if it's left to someone like Rand Paul to, to raise these questions, we're never gonna get anywhere. I mean, where, where are the, 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 the sort of Democrats who were going after Bush on these issues in the Congress. I mean, where, where have they been? They're out to lunch. And it, you know, it's Ron Wyden is probably the best senator on this issue right now. I mean, I wish Russ Feingold was back in the Senate because he would have been going after this. But you know, Ron Wyden of Oregon is doing it, and he's so timid, but he's doing the right thing, but he's so timid. We need to have actual lawmakers that represent us you know, on, on a whole slew of issues, but they just, I mean, it's, it, it really feels like we're, it's like herding cats, you know, to try to get them to do anything. I, I've talked to people that are, you know, J, JSOC, for instance, as a force, um, they, they do report to the Senate Armed Services Committee, and, and they have, uh, uh, they do in-camera briefings, you know, they do these secret briefings, and I've talked to people that have been privy to those briefings, and they were saying, you know, I'm, try, I was try, I'm trying to understand, like, what the relationship is between the, the, the handful of people in the U.S. government that actually technically have oversight capabilities of this elite force um, and, and sort of what's happening around the world. And, uh, and what I've been told is that the senators never ask any probing questions that would get to the heart of, of, of what's wrong with, with using these forces in the way we're using them because they don't want to know the answer. Because knowledge, it's a burden then. There's yeah. a moral burden on you when, you, when, you, <coughs> when you're faced with certain realities. Yes. I mean, it, I, we, there are photos in the book, and I, I, um, a couple of the photos are just pictures of kids in, in, uh, in Yemen. Yeah. And, and in one of the, the, the photos in the book, there's this little girl who was a survivor of the strike in Al-Majla in December of 09. And I think about her every day because um, when we were t taking pictures of, of, of her and filming interviews with some of the people there, she was just, she was staring at me, and her eyes are so adult. She's yeah. a tiny kid, but, but her picture. eyes are, are, are adult. But if you blow that picture up, and this is why it always has, sort of haunts me, if you blow it up, you can see in her eye the reflection of me standing in front of her. Very clearly, you can see me and Rick Rowley, the director yeah. of our film and, 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 and a wonderful cameraman, when he took the picture. And, and for me, that's, that speaks volumes to what it would take to actually change hearts and minds in this country. If, if, the, if the victims of the Majula bombing, if we knew their stories the way that we know the stories of a story of the eight-year-old boy who was killed in the Boston Marathon bombing and the beautiful picture that he did on Facebook. Yes. I don't yes. think Americans would, would support this. We don't even know who we're killing in these countries. Yes. And, I mean, so I, I've been saying, you know, I'm not a policy guy, but I really think that it's, whether you support drone strikes because you think it's a cleaner, smarter form of war, or you're against them, I think we can all agree that the point has come where there's, there should be a moratorium on it so we can figure out who's actually been killed. Like, George, like Governor Ryan did in Illinois with the death penalty. Yeah. It wasn't because he was a radical leftist at all. Yeah. It was because innocent people were being killed and they know, knew that from DNA evidence. So, yeah. you know, I, I, think it's, I think it's logical and I think it's a reasonable thing to ask that we know, actually know who we're killing in our wars. So I suppose if you were to say to policymakers, shouldn't we have a moratorium? Uh, while we figure out who these people are. I'm, I'm afraid the honest response is, Jeremy, we don't, we don't care who they are. They were on the monkey bars. Yeah, but although, I mean, I was re recently talking to a, a guy who, who was, uh, who, I have to be careful here, who was in the CIA and worked on Somalia and Yemen issues in the, in the CIA up until very recently. And he told me that everyone he knows is against the signature strike yeah. 
policy, the, the people that are doing the actual intelligence work in Yemen and Somalia, not the people planning the operations, but the people who are actually monitoring who the threats are, whether we're going to be more safe or less safe as a result of a particular decision, military decision, um, and that there's great consternation within that community right now because when we're doing these, tar these uh, signature strikes, which is such a, you know, it's so Orwellian the way that we come up with, you were talking about language earlier, oh, yeah. Terror Tuesdays, signature <clears throat> strikes, crowd killing, matrix. Tads, disposition matrix, um, and which is, the disposition matrix is a, is a almost like an, creating an al a computer algorithm for deciding when you assassinate someone and when you try to actually capture them, and it's sort of Brennan's uh, legacy will be the disposition, disposition ma matrix. Um, but you, you have this, uh, I think consternation within that community because I think that that there are very good people that work. I mean, you're a good person, Barry, and you were working in the CIA. I don't know if you're a good person when you were in the CIA, but you are now. Um, <laughs> but I, 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 I know people, and it's why Cheney and Rumsfeld hated the CIA, is that they considered it a liberal yeah. bunch of, I think they called them pansies. Yeah. And, uh, and, and of course, that's not true. But, but there are analysts there. There are people that really, that their whole life, what sure. they believe they're doing is keeping the country safe. Yes. They don't like this either. And I mean, and, and so you say, well, look, they should speak out. Well, what, what happened to Thomas Drake, the former NSA official? They will ruin your career. Yeah, that's right. they will, this presidency has gone after yeah. the, the, the whistleblowers in an unprecedented way. Right. And so we have this chill effect that's happened where people that would want to speak out are afraid because their lives are going yeah, to be even, it's destroyed. It's even more dangerous now than it ever was before. You know, I, uh, well, as you know, I mean, I, I started off in journalism working with the great Amy Goodman of mm -hmm. Democracy Now!, who really has just been, I still list Democracy Now! as my university uh, on Facebook. You know, that's where I went to school. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I did, I learned journalism as a trade, you know, like a carpenter or a plumber, as, a, as like an apprentice. I've never taken a journalism class, which is probably why I'm still a journalist. Um, but, um, and I, you know, I actually got rejected. I applied for an internship at The Nation magazine, and I was rejected. Um, and now I'm their national security correspondent, so I always tell the interns that I'm like, you guys are already a step ahead of me. Um, <laughs> but but you, know, you asked a motivation question. I, um, I actually do, I believe in America as a country. I, I really do. And I, I you know, if I, if I didn't, I, I would leave. I, the other thing about love it or leave it. Yes. Um, and, and, but I believe that part of changing the country and, and, and defending what is right about it. There's so much that's wrong about the history of America, and we, you know, we could start from the very foundation sure. of the country. But I'm, when I talk about America, I'm talking about people. Like, I think we have a great spirit as a society. We have, we have an obligation, and this, this, is what, this is what drives me. I feel that we have an obligation to, to go to the other side of the barrel of the gun and talk to the people that we're being told are our enemies. And I also feel like, uh, I, I believe with fierce passion that we have an obligation to tell the stories of people in countries around the world who are impacted by our policies in operations paid for with our money. And that, and that telling their, their story is part of fighting for the future of our country too. And I think that's what good journalism does. It's twofold. It gives voice to the voiceless, yeah. and it holds those in power accountable. And, 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 and at the end of the day, what I want this book to be is actionable intelligence for citizens to make, it's an it's a, it's a intelligence term, you know, you know yeah. but I want, as you know, um, I want it to be actionable intelligence that people can use to inform their decisions on what they think a policy should be or shouldn't be, and, and, and decide whether or not they want to get off their butt and try to do something about it. I have a question about perhaps another take on the title, Dirty Wars. The environmental impact of all these oh, wars, yeah. from the depleted uranium to just the huge petroleum use, or there's been rumors that Israel was considering striking a nuclear reactor in Iran. It's a pretty open question, but your take on yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you raised it. And it's, you know, it's, it's a little bit outside of my, my lane. I mean, there are, there are um, there's a, a, a British journalist who has been looking into trying to do an environmental impact study on, on drones in Yemen and, um, and to try to actually see the, poten you know, the potential environmental impacts of Hellfire missiles that are that are fired from the predators. I don't, to my knowledge, there hasn't really been a study yet of what is contained within those missiles. I mean, I did a lot of work on depleted uranium in the 1990s um, in Iraq, and just for you know, for people to understand, the U.S. was using these uh, depleted uranium uh, missiles, and also uh, in some cases they were using them in um, in bullet form too, and uh, and they did incredible environmental uh, damage to Iraq, and were directly linked to a, a severe increase in birth defects particularly in southern Iraq, which was hit very hard with depleted uranium munitions. Um, but in general, I mean, the whole, the, the whole war machine is just like one just 
catastrophic threat to the to the environment writ large. I mean, it's just a, it, you know you're 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 right to point that out, and it is indeed very very dirty. Um, and I've I've met incredible people, and almost everyone that I admire from that are journalists in other countries, none of them have journalism degrees. They they're all people that ended up going to a war zone because they felt like I'm I'm just going to give it a try. I'm gonna I want to try to be a reporter, and they went there. And it's um, you just meet amazing people, and I I, I always I, I don't encourage young people to drop out of college. But I, but I do think that you shouldn't let school get in the way of your education if you want to, you know, sort of make a change in the world. What is your 60-second idea to change the world? I think that it should be the responsibility of every American to make it their business to know, uh, to research the story of one person who's been killed um, in a U.S. military operation that was a, an innocent civilian, and to read their story and know it and, uh, and, and try to find as much information about them uh, as they can so that when you have these discussions about our policies, that there's a real story that you know and that you've internalized and you've owned as your own, almost like adopting a story. Um, I think if we all adopt a story uh, from halfway around the world of someone whose life was either ended or impacted in a tragic way by our policies, then we can't just be turning a blind eye um, to, to the realities of what our foreign policy is doing around the world. And you know, I think it's a, simple, it's a simple idea, but there's a broader principle there. And it's one that I, I, I try to particularly talk to a lot of young people about, that you know, empathy is a powerful, powerful yes. force. Yes. And, uh, and at the end of the day, I think that um, empathy results in people standing up for themselves and standing up for others. And that's the, I think that's the main motivating force, is that you see them as, as one of your own. And, and we need to do that with people that are impacted by our policies. And thank you guys so much. This is really an honor to be with you. And uh, thank you, Barry. Thank you, Commonwealth Club.